Recording. It doesn't turn. Oh, you're recording. I can see it flashing. Okay. All right. On the screen in the upper left corner of your picture. Oh, yeah, that's right. It's up in the, yeah, you can see it up, up in the left hand corner. Oh, yeah. Hi, everybody. Oh, here, recording. Hi. Hey, people Hi. On. Hello. Hello. You. Look at that nice hat, Dean. Well, I had to wear it. I told you that it's going to. I know. And Rick, Rick has. Hey, Rick, too. too. You're yeah. looking good, too, buddy. They're, they're <laughs> these are these are these are nice hats and uh, and if anybody's interested, I don't know if you can still get hats for them or not. But uh, yeah, uh, you can see that. Uh, it's, I, uh, I, was I hate to cover up my beautiful bald head, but I would like one of those hats. Okay, that's Chuck Morgan. Let me write Correct. it down. We can. Uh, I can. I have a few left from the original order, so. I can hook you up pretty quick. They're 20 bucks. No problem. Um, and I can order more if I need to. Okay. I'll send you an email, Chuck, and tell you when to come get it or whatever, okay? Uh, I appreciate that, Linda. Yeah. Thank you. So uh, do we have a, a head count for today, Linda? Um, I think maybe we could have 21. Oh, wow. 20, something like that, yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's if they all show they, up. Yeah, well, the important well, people show up. That's what I say. After hearing me last last time, maybe they don't want to show up anymore. So, oh, you know, no, they'd we'll, be. We'll, they'd we'll be, see. <laughs> they'd be silly not to show up. You did a great job last time. While we're waiting, um, Tony, you got, um, you know, I, I, I talked to you about the fact that uh, you're probably all set up except to put the reel on the rod. So uh, um, I think, you know, you, you shouldn't have any more problems other than, uh, you know, attaching the reel to the rod and, and stringing the line through the through the rod. I didn't know, did, Tony, did you hear me? <laughs> I was talking directly to you. Tony's muted. Oh, 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 okay. He's working on his unmute. Okay, well, what do you want me to get started? This uh, how many do we have so far? Nine. Huh? We, Nine. I don't know. One, two, three, four, five. We got nine. Six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, nine. Okay, thanks. Um, let's wait just a little bit longer. Uh, okay. Another minute or no, so. no, no rush. So while we're waiting, uh, you know, I sent out that that list of things that I use, and I and I know that some I, I don't use all of it because I don't use a sun glove and I don't use the uh, the magnifier because I'm I'm nearsighted anyway. I actually take my glasses off when I do my tying. Uh, but but did you did anybody have any questions on any of that stuff? I mean, some of it uh, you may not be familiar with, um, but if there's anything that uh, you know that you want to know about, I'm happy to answer any questions or. I think someone had questions with regard to um, what kind of vest to wear to use. I can't remember who it was that, that asked me that, but I think it was uh, Ross. Was it Ross? I don't know if he's on the call or not. Well, just I don't that. think we have a Ross. We have a Roy Christensen. Well, it was Roy. Was it Roy? I don't. I don't know. Someone was. Someone was asking me about uh, what kind of uh, it vest. It wasn't Roy. What kind of vest okay. to to uh, uh, to use? Was with this, um, and of course there are a lot of different options. I I've actually over the years probably had about eight or nine different vests, <laughs> including one that was custom made for me. But uh, now I use a uh, a system where there's a backpack in the back so that I can carry my lunch and my rain jacket and all my stuff in the back. Um, I also like to have a, uh, a, a system where there is a, uh, uh, a way for me to have water That's right. um, that, that is basically part of the system. And I, and I have a vest that actually has the water camel in the back and it has a tube that comes out to the front so that if I need water, I can drink it. And I can tell you right now, when you're out um, in the sun, fishing all the time, I mean, you really need to drink water. Um, 
because if you don't have water, you know, you, you, you may by the end of the day get cramped up and uh, it, it's not fun, um, you know, if you get the uh, leg cramps and all that. So I think drinking water is important. Um, I'm trying to think of anything else. Oh, the other thing is, you know, you're, uh, if you are going to be fishing or wading, uh, you, need a, you need a net and the net system that I use has a magnet at the back of my vest. It's hooked onto the back of my vest. It attaches uh, the net from the top of the net, not the handle, to my vest. And then it has a lanyard that goes from the, from the handle back to the, uh, back to the, it's attached back to the vest so that when you uh, use the, the net to catch a fish, um, if, you, if you happen to let the, the net go, you won't lose it. I mean, I can tell you right now, I've, I've, I've found nets floating down the river from people that didn't have a, a system to attach the net to their to their vest and uh, you know if you pay a hundred bucks for a net uh, for a net you, you really don't want to be losing that net so I, I would I would set up a system that actually does something like that and you can get them from Sims you can get them from Orvis um, they're you know they're, they're simple to set up and I think that they're uh, they're really good to have um, I, I, I said the same thing with regard to your, your waiting stick because, you know, if you have a waiting stick and you happen to let go of it, you don't want that waiting stick floating down the river. So uh, it, it usually uh, is better to have it attached, you know, to your, to your waiting belt. So um, other than that, I mean, I, I think the rest of it is pretty self-explanatory. Um, I wear a buff, and the buff uh, is, is is good because it protects your face and protects your your neck. Um, there are all kinds of buffs. I would say that uh, uh, there's a there's a guide that I work with a lot that, that I have with the boys, my grandsons in uh, in, in Montana, and he wore a, a buff. It was actually kind of like a hood, and it covered his entire face. I know, and because um, he was worried about. Uh, he was worried about uh, skin cancer and uh, Evine, yeah let me jump in a second just say if you're not muted um you might want to go ahead and do that unless you're speaking so we don't have any feedback and stuff while uh while dean is talking and uh uh you were talking about the buff dean but if you want to go into the your presentation at large uh, uh everybody knows dean umimoto uh if you're joining us for the first time i just want to thank him again for coming up with this he's our new chair of the education committee. And I'm uh, so thrilled that he uh, agreed to do this and came up with this because uh, I think he's got us on a good, on a good uh, track here. So Dean. Oh, um, so one you. of the things that I wanted to mention was um, um, every month um, the, the, the club uh, publishes a newsletter that Linda uh, has been uh, putting out and, uh, and they have some great articles in there. Uh, so I thought I'd mention that to you. In December, there was, a, there was an article on casting, and I'll talk a little bit about that later. And then uh, I think this, this month, there was, a, uh, there was a, an article by, I think it was Jerry Borger, uh, on uh, fishing rivers. And uh, I can tell you right now, Borger is one of the top fly fishing writers in the, in the, in the country, maybe the world. He's very well known. He has a PhD, so he's, not, he's a smart guy. And uh, uh, he's written a lot about fishing and he's, and he's actually uh, uh, done a, a documentary on uh, fly fishing in the Catskills. So, uh, you know, you can check those kind of things out on your own. Um, but anyway, I was, I was talking about that checklist and, uh, and the only other thing is I would say that I have a friend who, uh, who has uh, had many bouts with, with cancer. So wearing a buff I think is important and he also wears a sun glove. Uh, and the sun glove is a glove that has, uh, it, it's fingerless, but it protects your hands uh, from the sun. And um, I, I think it's probably uh, a good idea. I mean, if you, if you have had any uh, bouts with skin cancer, it could be pretty nasty. And I think you need to protect yourself, uh, you know, besides wearing, uh, uh, you know, sunscreen and all that. I think, I think having things like that are, good to have and I always wear long sleeve shirts and I wear long sleeve pants when I'm you know even if I'm fishing in in, uh, in Mexico uh, you know you want you want to protect yourself from the sun because it could be pretty intense um, okay any other questions on the stuff I sent out earlier or if you have any comments or anything that you want to know about before I get started 
Okay, so now Hi, we're going to talk. Um, go I'm joining. I'm joining this meeting for my father. He's having trouble receiving audio for some reason, and um, he's been looking forward to this meeting for some time. And I actually hmm. do not see him. Oh, I do see him on this. I meeting. see him on the he's call. Not, yeah, he's not receiving audio. So I'm just going to be in this meeting to uh, help facilitate my father. Thank oh. you. Okay. It's, um, it's fine. You're welcome. No problem. Thank you. I'm not sure what uh, the problem is. Um, yeah, he 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 should have said uh, join with computer audio when he joined in. Maybe go out and come back in again. No, yeah. don't don't worry about it. He's okay. Apparently, I just found out he never used audio on his computer yet. So okay. don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, Rick, do I have the control of the screen at this point, or do I need do I need to do anything? Okay, uh, so what I wanted to do was uh, I want to I don't know if you can see this. Hopefully, you can see this. This is Karen. This is my wife. Can you see? Can you all see that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, so Karen is Karen is four eleven. She weighs about hundred pounds. That's that's a, a nineteen twenty inch rainbow that she caught with a dry fly. And um, I wanted to show you the fly that she caught it with. I mean the the actual hatch that we were experiencing experiencing was called a trico hatch. Oh my God! Now, this is this is not trico electric. This is the actual trico, which is a <laughs> mayfly that Eric is going to talk about a little bit maybe next week. Um, I was trying to figure out how to explain the size of this fly. This fly, I mean, falls on the Missouri. I mean, it, it falls like in the millions. But anyway, the the uh, the fly is about the size of a grain of rice. So it, it's it's very small. I mean, it's really small. Um, and um, when when it lands on the water, this is blown up. But this is this is what it looks like. It 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 basically this is a fly that is actually mated. It's dropped its eggs, and now it is it is basically dead. <laughs> and 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 when you use what is called a spinner, uh, it's a fly that that kind of mimics this this particular. Uh, insect, uh, but it's it, it's really very small. Uh, so what what I wanted to point out was that when I talk about casting, uh, I thought about how how can I explain to you? Can you all see this? Okay. Um, I I wanted to figure out you know what's the best way to to teach a class on casting without actually being in, in, you know, able to actually help you guys make the cast. And I thought maybe what I can do is, is tell you how these casts are used and why they're important. And, um, and then we can hopefully when things get better and we all have our shots, we can go out and um, go to Linda's favorite pond and we can, we can actually uh, practice the, you know, the casting there. Uh, it, it's not quite the same uh, so today I'm going to talk about the different types of casts. I'm going to talk about line control, and then I'll talk about practicing. So the most important cast that you need to learn is the overhead cast. And uh, all the other casts that you will ever use begin with the overhead cast. And um, uh, in the article, that, uh, that Linda published uh, last month in the newsletter. He talks about making that cast. But um, I can tell you that, you know, it's difficult to understand exactly what he's saying unless you can actually see it. And um, so I think that, and I'm gonna put this down and I'm gonna go back to the, uh, hopefully I don't know exactly how we do this. How do we go back to this? Uh, 
So somehow I lost the whatever it is that I need to. Uh, Rick, you want to jump in and tell me what I need to do here to get back to the regular screen? I guess you guys can see me. Okay, so I'm sure. Oh, okay. There you go. Okay. Um, so, you know, when he, I'm, I'm going to go, I'm going to just kind of demonstrate what he was talking about. Can you see my hand? What he's talking about is basically stopping from here to here. And that's all, all he's talking about is, you know, it doesn't, you don't, you don't bend your wrist. I said that that's an important part. You keep your wrist stiff and you're going from here to here. And um, basically it's basically from the, from 11 to one o'clock, one time. And essentially that's, that's the overhead cast. Um, now I'm going to tell you that, you know, that's that, you know, Karen likes to fish. She doesn't like to fish like I like to fish. She doesn't have the passion. So, you know, when it comes to these other casts that I'm going to talk about, I mean, she basically does the overhead. She's very good at that particular cast. So she catches fish and she catches big fish with dry flies. So um, I'm, I, I wanted to point that out because I think that if you can learn that particular cast and you can learn it to a point where you can put it where you want to put it so that you actually have a chance of getting the fly to the fish, uh, I think that's the most important cast you can learn. Okay, the next cast is the roll cast. Um, if you guys have your thing, I mean, the roll cast is essentially a cast that, um, Dean? We, we use this cast when... Dean? Go ahead. Somebody had a question. Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, could I just comment on your on your uh, the cast you were talking about, the overhead cast? Yeah. Just a, a, since there's no real visuals and not knowing how much everybody knows and understands, uh, that's a cast that goes as far behind you as it goes towards you if you're not yeah. throwing out line. So... <laughs> Uh, and, and it comes like most of these things, uh, golf and all the rest of it, it comes with loading this instrument you have in your hand. So it, it helps if you try to feel when you're taking it back and your line has to get out behind you straight out, you need to have it kind of, you got to need to see if you can feel it in your hand if that line is straight there before you go the other direction. It, you just, it's, it's a smooth functioning thing, but you kind of have to have a feel. And right. Nothing like being out in the- in Yeah, the, it's very difficult to show up there. Water to do that. So and, that helps the visualization right. of what that overhead cast is. It's a, and for the newbies, I just like to say that the overhead cast is what you basically think of when you think of a fly cast, I think, yeah. from, as a new that person. Um, and, and I think that the challenge is to not <laughs> do it too fast. Well, in fact, you know, the longer the line that you have out, the more you have to pause. And um, because if you try to start your forward cast too soon, what will happen is that you'll get a knot in the line and, and you'll get a knot in your leader. And so you have to begin to learn that. But you, you, you really can't learn that unless you're actually using a fly rod and, and out there trying to, to make the cast. So, so when we have an opportunity to get outside, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about the pause and we'll talk about actually making that cast on a regular basis. Um, Rick brings up an important concept and uh, it, it's hard to explain this concept and Rick, uh, maybe you can help me with this, but the concept of loading. Um, when you're making the roll cast, and, well, let me tell you why you need a roll cast. The reason is because uh, if you're on a river or a stream, and uh, you have uh, bushes behind you or trees behind you, if you make a regular cast, your fly is gonna get hooked into the tree or the bush. And uh, it, I mean, I, I can tell you right now, it happens to me all the time. I, I don't care how good of a caster you are, it's gonna happen. Uh, even the best, best fishermen uh, from time to time will get their fly caught in the bushes. And, and sometimes it'll come right out and then sometimes you have to go all the way back to the bush and take it out. Uh, if it gets caught in a tree, you may not get your fly back um, because of, you know it may be hooked up into a branch or something and you'll never get it out. Um, so the roll cast 
is is used uh, in a way that you're not really making a back cast. You're really bringing the rod up, and then you're making a a, a rolling motion so that the line comes out and goes out straight. And um, the, the the loading factor uh, that Rick is talking about. What happens is the tension of the water that holds the line allows you to provide enough load to make that that cast. Uh, Rick, do you have anything that you can add? I mean, I, you know probably more about it than I than I do because you do a lot more of it with your spay spay rod. But no, I think that's that's very good. And it, and again, it gets back to uh, this load situation with your rod and it's it's hard to talk about and but if you just think about feeling it when you're out practicing your casting it'll come and you'll know when you're doing things correctly properly and correctly <laughs> so it's uh but the but the roll cast is uh, you keep the everything is in front of you nothing kind of a little bit of a loop will form behind you but it'll only be a couple of feet so right. you, you don't have much line behind you versus the overhead cast. Your your line might be going back thirty feet. Yeah. So, uh, it's a it's a beautiful cast, and especially if you're doing little in a lot of small streams, uh, you're just you're you're making very small cast. You're just you're just you're just want to place it out there, maybe six or eight feet in front of you, because it's going to drift right down in this. Spot where you're I, I, I will mention another cast that I was taught uh, this cast. I mean, I was actually, I guess I knew about it, but I didn't. Uh, I was actually down in Mexico and um, this, this guide was telling me that um, you should use a steeple cast. And I said, I, I said, why? He says, because we have a wind in our face. And if you use a steeple cast, you can, you can make the cast and go down through the wind. And um, I thought about that, and I, you know, I used it, and it it, it worked. But um, actually, the first time I used a steeple cast was on a small stream in Pennsylvania. And um, when when you make a steeple cast, if you have a lot of stuff behind you, rather than a, a roll cast, you you're basically bringing the rod straight up like that, and the and the line comes up behind you, but it doesn't go back; it goes straight up. And then instead of instead of going down, you're just basically straightening it out and going forward. So it's kind of like the roll cast, except that you're making the cast a little differently. Um, the, the, the first time I, I tried to do the roll cast, I mean, I, I wasn't very successful. I mean, I <laughs> could make it maybe a 15, 20 foot roll cast, um, but I have seen people, um, guides and, and really good fishermen make roll casts of you know, 30, 40, 50 feet. I mean, they're, they're, it's amazing how, how far they can cast. So again, it just takes practice. Um, and I think it's something that, uh, you know, I wanted to mention to you because I think you need to, you know, it'd be good for you to learn it uh, if you can and then, uh, uh, and try it, uh, you know, when you're on the water. Um, the other cast that I want to mention is a men cast, that's number, that's C on the list of, of casts. Um, and I'm going to talk about mending in the next section, but men, a men cast is a cast that people use when they, when they want to position the, the, the line in a certain, in a certain uh, spot. In other words, if you're standing here and the fish is actually in a spot where you want to move your, your line that way, basically what you're doing is you're, you're, you're making a loop with your, with your rod and the line comes out in that direction. Um, it's hard to explain. Uh, if you look at videos of, of men casting on, on YouTube, you'll see uh, people doing it. I've got a friend, uh, he's from Japan. He, he, he can make men casts that are unbelievable. I've seen him catch fish that are 50, 60 feet away from him using a men cast and putting the fly right in, right in front of the, the fish. Um, I was in a spot one time where he, he, got, he caught so many fish, I guess he got bored. And the rest of us caught fish, but he was catching like, you know, one after another um, in positions where um, most people would not be able to even make the cast. So uh, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good cast to learn. And the last one I have on the list is a double haul. And the double haul, um, well, well, if you ever do any fishing in saltwater, 
you, you pretty much need to learn how to double hull because a lot of the casts you're gonna make in salt water are long casts. You're casting to a particular spot and you're waiting for the fish, you know, to come into uh, the, you know, the strike zone. Uh, so they want you to make casts that are 50, 60, 70 feet long and uh, trying to make that cast with a, a single motion is very difficult. Uh, a double haul, what happens with a double haul is that there's a lot of line out and as you're making the cast going back, you're pulling on the line. So it increases the speed of the line. And then as it comes forward, you pull on it again and it increases the line going forward, the line speed. So then what happens is as it go forward, all the line that you have slack line that's at your, at your feet comes shooting out, comes shooting out of the rod and it is, it'll go, I mean, you may have 25, 30 feet and you might have another 20 feet at your feet. And then as you're making the cast, you go like that and, they, and the line just shoots out. Um, that is a that is a cast that I can make, so I, I have learned that one. And uh, it's a cast that I think we will try to teach you um, when we can go out to a pond and actually, you know, you, you can actually try it because it, it it's not that hard. Um, and and the whole concept of loading, you will feel when you do a double haul, you will feel the haul, you will feel the load on the line as you do it, and it'll make it. And you'll, you know, and you'll get the feel of it. And once you get the feel of it, it you won't, it's like riding a bicycle. You won't, you won't forget it. Okay. Um, any questions on any of that? I mean, I, I don't think there's anything I can, I can do to show you anything more about that because it's very difficult to do it. Uh, Dean, I'll just say about the roll cast. I learned it um, a little bit later, but have found it even works really great at the Saddlebrook ponds because mm -hmm. sometimes people are walking behind yeah, you yeah. you're fishing and you don't want to <laughs> hook them because it's not going to look good you for the club. You don't um, want <laughs> and, uh, and you don't need to fish out in the middle of the lake. A lot of times the fish are up close. So yeah. just put you, that you, plug out. Yeah, you really don't want to put a hook in someone's eye. So you, you, have, to, you, have, you have to be very careful, you know. Uh, mind your cast. I, I mentioned that in the, last, in the last lecture. I said, mind your cast, mind where it's going. Um, I will tell you about another cast that I use when there's a lot of wind and uh, I'm right-handed. So I make the cast this way normally, but if there's a lot of wind in a particular spot and I need to switch, I'll make the cast this way. I never learned to cast with my left hand. I have friends that have, uh, are able to cast with their left hand almost as well as their right hand. And so they can actually you know, change. And the reason is because you don't want that fly hitting you in the face. You know, in other words, if the fly, if the, if there's a wind coming from your right, you don't want that fly coming back and hitting you in the face. So by making the cast with your left hand, you know, the line is going that way if there's a wind. But if you if you don't know how to do that, then you can also do it this way over over your left shoulder. And uh, I have done that, and I I can do it fairly well. So I'm 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 able to do it if there's a if there is a wind that uh, that I want to try to you know avoid. Uh, uh, you know, getting stuck by the by the fly, um, and these are these are things you know that if you if you're out there and you're practicing and you're with you know with other people, if you're with a guide or you're with one of, one of us, I mean, we would point the, these things out to you, and then you could you know you can try them. Um, okay, any other questions on that? I have a question. Can you can show you? double ball again? Can you show the motion for the double ball again? Well, the, the regular overhead is like this. And when you're doing a double haul, you're basically pulling line, you, you basically pull line off the reel so that there's maybe, let's say you've got 25, 30 feet of line out in the water. And then you've got another 15, 20, 25 feet of line at your foot, okay? Now, if you're in a boat, the line's there, it's very easy. If you're in the water, it becomes a little bit of a mess, you know, having all that, all that line up. But what happens is that when you do that pull, it increases the line speed of, a, it, it increases the line speed so that the line goes out. And then as you pull again and you let go, it shoots all of that line from, the, from your reel, the, I mean, that's lying at your feet, out of the rod, straight out. And, um, all I can say is if you, if you try it, 
you and you feel it. Once you understand, you know that feeling of, of what what's going on with the rod and the, and the line, um, you won't forget it. I mean, uh, you'll realize, okay, um, you know, um, I can normally cast twenty feet, but with a double haul, I can cast forty or fifty feet. And um, um, you know, when when you're in saltwater, and and Karen and I have been to the Bahamas, have been to Venezuela, Brazil. <laughs> A lot of different places, um, and and basically, you do need to make long casts there uh, for trout. Um, like I say, you know, unless you're uh, okay. Here's a situation that that can happen. You can be in a uh, in an area where you can wait out only so far, and you see fish rising, maybe forty feet from you, but between you and that fish, you know that, that if you go too much further, you're gonna you know, come up to your, your neck in water. So uh, if you can make a double haul, you can reach that fish. So once you learn how to do it, you, know, you can reach those fish. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I've seen people, I mean, I, I, can, I can cast fairly far without a double haul. Um, but, um, but I know that um, from time to time, I'll see fish rising in the middle of the channel of a river. And I really want to, I really want to catch one of them. And, and I will use a double haul to get that, get that fly line out there. That makes sense? Yes. Uh, Dean, one question. Yeah. When you were describing that, you were saying as you were doing your back cast, you were pulling line off of the reel. No, that doesn't no, make sense, Mary. No, you strip no, me a back no. through the the uh, no, yeah. <laughs> When you when you're going to do a double haul, you have line off the reel that you haven't got out on your on your. In other words, let's say you have a a fish out there forty feet. Right. Yeah. You're right? Fine. You got so, a couple of line at your feet. Right. And, and you've you got about twenty feet. Cast, are you right. stripping? No, are you're you're, you're, you're not stripping more. More off the reel, or are you pulling no. back through the eyelets? When you when you go back, you're pulling on the line. Not you're not pulling line out. You're just pulling on the line. So you're increasing. You're you're pulling on the line that is that has actually gone through and at, at the tip of your rod. Okay, so you're okay. pulling on it. Yeah. You said it the opposite earlier. That's what. Yeah, you're yeah, yeah. When you're pulling on it, it increases the line speed, and then when you pull it forward, when you pull it again, it shoots the line out. So that all yeah. the slack line at your feet will go out. Hey, hey Dean, I'll yeah. just mention to folks, there are tons of great videos online that yeah. show you these concepts, which would make it easier than just listening to someone talk about it. I'll include some links in the next newsletter. So watch for that. That'd be great. But, but Orvis, for example, has tons of great ones. Yeah, that'd be great. And then, and then also when we do it in person. Go ahead. I just posted an Orvis backcast instructional video in the chat. Okay. Um, thanks, Annette. A lot of some people may not even know about the chat, um, but but if you guys look at the bottom of your screen, where the mute and and participants and all that um, is, there's a a button called chat, and if you open that up, then you can um, communicate with people in the class, uh, either by name or to everyone. And if you click on it, you can see that Annette has right. posted an instructional video. And the chat box is on the right, so it's, 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 it's not you know, beside the screen, so you can actually still watch the screen and have the chat box there. You can leave it open. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, so your, um, your cast for the saltwater fishing, the double cast, mm -hmm. I think you called it, um, that would be where you're repeatedly doing a back cast, but feeding out more line each time? Well, um, no. Um, basically, what the what the guide will say on the boat is he'll say, "All right, so we have uh, we have some bonefish coming, and I, we're going to do maybe a session on saltwater saltwater fishing." But basically, to, just to give you the idea, he might say, "We have some fish coming at eleven o'clock," and um, sixty feet. You know, it, it may be well when when he sees it, it may be a hundred feet away. So he'll tell you to wait, and then he'll tell you to make a cast. But he wants you to make the cast. 50 or 60 feet out in front of the fish and trying to make a, a cast without uh, a double haul that far is pretty tough. So, so basically you might have 30 feet of line out and then you might have 30 feet of line at your feet on the boat. 
-hmm. then as you make the cast, you're going back and you're pulling. And then as you make the forward cast, you pull again. And then all that line that's at your feet will just come shooting out. And, right. uh, you know, and then when, when the line hits the, the water and it's sitting there, he basically wants you to do it before the fish are there because he doesn't want you to spook the fish. So mm -hmm. you make the cast, the line, the line is out there and you might have a shrimp pattern or you might have some kind of a, a, a bait fish pattern and it's in the water um, and you can see the fish. I mean, you can see the bottom of the, uh, you know, of the sand and you can see the fish and then he'll tell you to wait until the fish are close and then as soon as you get, he thinks the fish are close enough to see your fly, he'll, start, he'll tell you to strip. And if it's oh, a okay. if if it's a crab or a shrimp, he'll say strip slow. So you're doing slow, just like a crab or or whatever. And it's amazing. It, it's for me, you know. I, I I never liked anything other than trout, dry fly trout fishing. Mm -hmm. But when I went down to Mexico or the Bahamas or whatever, you know, to do uh, bonefish and permit fishing, you can see the fish take the fly in the water because the fun. water and the water is so clear. And, uh, and so I really, I, I do like that. And uh, I'm planning to go uh, again. I'm gonna go to Montana twice this, this summer, but I also am planning a trip in, in September to go to Mexico because I wanna go down there and fish uh, for the uh, permit and, uh, and bone fish. Okay, any other questions? All right, line control. Uh, I've got three things listed, retrieval, mending, and then downstream. Um, line control is important whether you're nymphing or dry fly fishing, it doesn't make any difference which one. Um, you have to retrieve your fly that's on the water at the speed that the fly is moving. And the reason is because if you retrieve too fast, it creates drag and the fish will not take the fly. Um, even if you're nymphing, uh, if you don't retrieve properly, for example, uh, when you first start nymphing in a river or a stream, if you don't retrieve fast enough and you have too much slack, in other words, if you have too much line out and you see that the strike indicator goes down or stops, you know, the, you know that possibly the fish has taken the fly. If you lift your rod up and you have a lot of slack, by the time you actually connect with the fish, that fish is gone. So you have to retrieve, you have to learn how to retrieve the line, especially in moving water. You have to learn how to retrieve the line at a speed that is the same as the, as the actual fly is coming back to you. Now, when you're in a spring creek, uh, or if you're in uh, certain areas where the, the, the flow is, uh, is, is fairly reasonable, this will not be a problem. But, you're, but if you're in a river where the spring creek is coming, where the water is coming down pretty quickly, you're gonna have to retrieve pretty fast. <laughs> so you have to learn how to do that, All right? I mean, that's not an easy thing. And I, and I think some people don't realize that when you're nymphing, you have to do the same thing. Because if you leave a lot of line out there, like I said before, and you see that the strike indicator that you have on the, on the uh, 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 tippet or whatever, on the leader, it stops or goes down, you cannot, you can't, you can't hook the fish. Because by the time you lift up and get all that slack off the water, that fish is gone. Because the fish will suck the fly in and spit it out in a second. Okay. Um, the second thing I have on my list is mending. And I told you about the mend cast, but even if you don't know how to do the mend cast, if you make a cast to a fish, and let's say that you have a fish that, let's say the current is going to your right and uh, the fish is on the bank. What, what you have to realize is that the current where you're standing is going faster than the current on the bank. The reason the fish is on the bank is that, you know, the, the trout is basically 
opportunistic and basically, you know, the, the, the fish does not want to work hard to eat their food. So they're going to be in the, on, the, on the areas where there's less current. And um, so if they're on the bank, here's the problem. When you make the cast out to the fish, and let's say you made a 20 foot cast and the fly is going toward the fish, but the current where you're standing pulls your line and all of a sudden that, that fly begins to move because of the current that's pulling your line. If that happens, the fish will not take your fly. Okay? So when you do uh, a cast to a fish on a bank and you know there's a lot of water between you and the fish and there's a lot of different kinds of current between you and the fish, you do what is called a mend. And when you do the mend, what I do if I'm um, fishing to a fish on a bank is I will actually go upstream of that fish in the water. I'll make the cast toward the fish, but I'll try to get the cast four or five feet above the fish. And then I have slack in my, um, you know, from the reel. And then I'll lift the rod and you go up to the left. And that what, what happens is it pulls the line up and it moves it over to the left so that you, you have now a bow in the line so that as the current takes your line, it doesn't affect the fly uh, that's going toward the fish. Now, this is kind of hard to explain and it's hard to look, teach this if you're not on moving water. But uh, it is something that I think you really need to think about learning because if you, you know, as you, as you look at your line, you can see your line moving one way or the other, depending on the current, and you have to move, you have to mend the line one way or the other, depending on how the line is, line is moving. Uh, if you're on a boat and you have a good guide, he will tell you to mend left or right. I mean, he'll, he'll, he'll instruct you because he wants, he wants that fly to be moving uh, without any drag. And that's even true, even if you're nymphing from a boat. And it's much easier to mend from a boat because you're, you're, you're higher, you're off the water and you're a little bit higher. So it's much easier to move the rod and move the line that way, one way or the other. Um, any questions on that? I think it's, it's a little hard to understand that, but I, but I think you'll learn it uh, when you're on, on uh, a river or a stream. Uh, Dean, I, maybe yeah. I zoned out. I'm not sure if, if you said this or not. If you did, forgive me. Um, I, I, I think the, the man, the whole purpose is to make sure that you're, or not the whole purpose, but main purpose is to make sure that your fly is moving at the right speed, speed right? Correct. So and you don't want natural. you don't you don't want the line to drag the fly at all because if if for example you're on moving water and the line is, and, and your line is moving faster than the fly which is close to the bank what will happen is the line will actually pull the fly away from the fish so the mending allows the line to have you know more movement without without moving the fly is that I don't know if that makes sense, but that's basically what you're trying to do. Um, Rick or to get the Eric, you have any? Fly to move at the same speed as the water. Exactly. You don't, and you don't want it to drag, because if there's any drag on that fly, if the the fish can see it, okay, and uh, and even if it's a nymph underwater, they can sense if there's something wrong. If the if the if the nymph is not moving at the right speed, they 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 kind of sense it. And if you're, if, you're, if you're trying to catch a fish that's uh, anywhere between 16 and 20 inches or more, that fish has been caught. You know, one of the great things about catch and release is that you have more fish out there that grow to a big size. One of the bad things about catch and release is that fish has probably been caught. By the time that fish is, if you're on a, a really major fishing area like the Missouri or Henry's Fork, that fish has been probably caught, you know, 15, 20 times during its lifetime uh, by fishermen that probably are are as good or better than you are. And so therefore, if they sense anything wrong with that fly, when it's approaching them, they will not eat it. They won't take it. Um, and I can tell you, um, I've been on, uh, you know, like the Henry's Fork, and I mentioned this before, I, I made a cast, to a I, made, I was fishing this one fish for about half an hour. 
And I finally got that fish to come up and, and, and bump the fly. I thought he was going to eat the fly, but he never took it. He just bumped the fly with the nose and went back down. So, I mean, uh, I can tell you right now that any kind of drag at all, <laughs> and you're not going to, you're not going to catch that fish. Um, now, the last county kind of uh, line control issue is downstream casting. In certain areas where you have fish that have been caught a lot, they become very, you know, they become very picky. And so um, I usually will use the downstream cast or at least a cast that as uh, I'm above the fish where the, the fly is coming down. So here's the problem with a downstream cast. If you make a downstream cast, then you have to keep feeding line out of your, of your rod so that the fly keeps going at a constant speed toward the fish. Um, it's again, something that you have to learn how to do by being on water. And um, there are a lot of ways to do it. I mean, I, I just actually just flip, flip the rod like this. I have, you know, and I'm, and I'm actually taking with my left hand, I'm actually taking line out of my, my reel and I'm just flipping it. But here's the issue. If you're on a creek or a river where the, where the, uh, the flow is relatively moderate, you can do that and you can go a long way. I mean, you can actually go downstream 40, 50 feet before, before you have any drag. But if the, if the water flow is a little faster, it becomes very difficult because you have to keep flipping out, you know, line uh, pretty quickly. And, it, and, it's, and it's not as easy, okay? Um, again, you know, in order, in order to practice that, you probably need to be on a, a creek or a river in order to practice that. Um, all right. The last item that I wanted to talk about was practicing. Um, and, 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 and what I wanted to say about this is that um, if, if any of you have played any sports, I think you know that when you practice, what happens is that you eventually get to a point where you don't have to think like if you're starting to play, uh, I don't know, basketball, you know, when you first start playing basketball, you have to think about everything, you know, how to bounce the ball, how to, you know, but when you do it enough, you get to a point where you're not really thinking about dribbling. You're not really thinking about stopping and jumping and making the shot. You just do it automatically. Um, if you play, if you play golf and you watch the, the pros, um, they have muscle memory they've practiced so much that when they get into a certain position or a certain spot with regard to their ball in the sand trap or driving or whatever, they're not thinking about what they need to do because if you think about what you need to do, you won't do it right anyway. So I think you need to get to a point where you have muscle memory that you're not thinking about how you're going to make the cast. Uh, I, I, I can only say that, you know, I, I, I thought about this and I thought, well, the only way to explain it is really uh, through uh, sports and how these people practice. I mean, you see these, these kids, you know, in Indiana or California or wherever they're in, you know, or DC, Washington, DC, and they're out there and they're practicing and play, playing basketball, you know, constantly. And so by the time they get into college, I mean, they're not thinking about what do I need to do when I'm at, when I'm at this particular spot on the court they know exactly what they need to do and they're just doing it automatically. When you, when you try to catch fish, it's the same thing. Uh, when I'm out there thinking about catching fish, I'm thinking about what position I have to be in, where do I need to be in order to catch that particular fish. Um, I, I, I'm not thinking about uh, my cast because I just, I just automatically do it. I don't think about what I'm gonna do, I just do it. Um, and I'm, I'm telling you that um, I remember when I first started going to Henry's Fork, um, it, they have fly fishermen from all over the world, Norway, Japan, Italy. I mean, I, I've met fishermen from everywhere in the world going to Henry's Fork. So the very best fishermen are there. 
uh, the very best fishermen of all the fishermen are the Japanese. Uh, and we have some Japanese friends who are expert fishermen. And um, I was watching this one guy and he was making downstream casts and he was, and that, that fly was going down 40, 50 feet and he was, and he was catching fish. And um, so I, I'm, I'm talking to him afterwards, you know, when we're having dinner. And I said, so, you know, Seiji, how do you, how'd you learn all this? He says, oh, he says, you know, wintertime, we go out, we practice in the parking lot. I said, really? He says, every day. <laughs> they go out and they practice and they practice and they practice. So they get to a point where they really know what the heck they're doing. And uh, so then when they come out to Montana or Idaho, you know, they, they, they're very good at, at, at what they do. So all I can say is that um, when I first started fishing, uh, at the end of the day when I was on a river, I would take about 10, 15 minutes and I would just practice, just practicing my cast. I wasn't trying to catch a fish. I was just trying to practice so that I could begin to learn how to make certain casts. And, uh, you know, and I got to a point where I was relatively able to, you know, to do that without thinking about it again. Um, so here you have, uh, I have ABC lakes. lakes. Uh, you can go to a lake or pond and you can practice most of the casts that we're talking about. Um, one of the advantages of a river or a stream is that you have moving water, which changes the, um, the way that the fly will move. And so then you can practice your mending and other things. But I think that um, my, my last item that I said on practicing is you can practice anywhere. Uh, I think I told you that when I first started uh, learning how to fish, I, I would sit there while I was watching TV and I'd be going like this, you know. <laughs> and I'd drive Karen crazy because, you know, she was like, what the hell are you doing, you know? And uh, I was just trying to get to a point where I, I, I had that memory in my muscle that I, I didn't want to go too far back and I didn't want to go too far forward. And I would just do it on a regular basis. Um, so, um, Looking at these videos, I think are good. I think the, the articles that uh, uh, the Linda has, has published on the newsletter, uh, if you read them, they mean there's some great articles in there. Uh, I think going on online uh, and watching uh, those videos uh, online about all these different items, I mean, you can learn from that. And then ultimately, uh, you've got to go out and practice. Otherwise, you're never going to get better. Um, because you don't really want to be thinking about what you need to do. You just want to do it. You know, you just want to automatically do it. And that's uh, probably the best advice I can give you. But again, if you learn the overhead and you learn it well, I think that's really, um, you know, the primary cast, you know, that everything comes off of. And um, I think that, you know, you'll be able to catch fish um, anywhere if you can do the basic overhead cast. Um, so that's all I had today. Uh, I think, Linda, I think we're talking about maybe doing something when the weather gets warmer and possibly when we've all had our shots and we're comfortable going outside and being in a bigger group where we can actually practice. I think that that would be a good idea and we can maybe plan on doing something. I was thinking about doing it in the beginning of March, uh, maybe. Um, hopefully by then, the, you know, the weather will be a little warmer. Um, but is there any comment about that? Are, are most of you interested in doing something like that? Um, Dean, we, we did have a comment from Annette, who um, is Tony's daughter, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, she says it might be helpful to tell people what rate rod, what weight rod is oh. useful for your club. <laughs> My father is a fly rod, but it's pretty heavy, much heavier than what I use for stream fishing. And I'm going to guess you're going to say a nine foot five weight. Or an eight and a half foot five weight. Yeah. Yeah, but um, the rod is, is determined, the, the rod, um, the weight of the rod is determined by the material. Mm -hmm. um, so. So we're using graphite blanks. Uh, my yeah. husband builds the rods and they're pretty much, they're, they're lightweight, but yeah. not the lightest weight. And we use them for pretty close stream fish, fishing. We yeah. fish a lot of here, stream fish. Yeah. And at here in, uh, uh, in the West, uh, I mean, I, when I fish in, uh, in, in Pennsylvania or Maryland, I, I have a home in Maryland and I know you live in Maryland and I, 
I fished all the streams. I, I fished the gunpowder. Yeah, I fished all the streams. And, oh, and basically, cool. um, back home, I have, uh, you know, I have uh, three weights, four weights, five weights, six weights, yeah. And, and I'll use a two or three weight, which is very light. Uh, here, we also fish in central Pennsylvania near um, State College. Yeah, we fish a lot there. Um, in Penn's Creek and all those creeks up there. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're going to be fishing out west, uh, I, I mentioned to, in, the, in the first lecture, I went through all of that. And I, I said probably the best rod for the west is the five weight. Um, because okay. uh, the five weight is kind of an all around rod. Uh, the rivers here are bigger. Uh, even the spring creeks are bigger. Um, oh. And, uh, you know, the spring creeks up in Livingston are some of the most well-known spring creeks in the world. Uh, and those spring creeks, um, I still use a four weight or five weight. I usually use a four weight on those, on those rivers, on those uh, streams. Um, but I would say on the Missouri or Henry's Fork or uh, the Madison, uh, or uh, up in New Mexico, you have the San Juan. Those are bigger rivers. And I usually will use a five weight um, okay. because, you know, I think the five weight is a, is a, is a better all around rod. But if you're using um, a rod that is uh, made of, uh, you know, they have all kinds of rods, but you know, there are, there are rods that are five weights that are as light as the old, uh, you know, three weights uh, 20 years ago um, because of the material, uh, the mm -hmm. graphite or whatever it is that they're using to make the rod. Um, yeah. The rod that your, your dad bought was a fiberglass rod. And uh, I think maybe it is a five weight black fiberglass rod. I, I don't know anything about that rod, um, but uh, My husband possibly. has been building rods lately with graphite blanks yeah. that he buys from South Korea. Yeah, graphite is probably the one that most people have. And uh, I think that uh, they're probably for, for, you know, in other words, you want something that's strong and, uh, and at, at the same time is light enough so that it's easier to cast. And I think that the graphite provides that. Um, and that technology came from, uh, I think, from, from golf and from, uh, uh, from tennis because, mm -hmm. you know, the pros began to use, uh, instead of steel, they, be, you know, they were using wood, they were using steel and tennis, and now they use graphite type, you know, blanks. Uh, the same thing with, uh, uh, you know, golf, you know, they use graphite rods. So uh, basically the, the fly rods are the same thing. I think you have uh, lighter weight rods that are still strong enough uh, to carry a five weight line. Or uh, like I, I, when I go down to uh, the Bahamas or Mexico, I use a, I have, I, I usually carry a seven, eight, nine and 10 weight rods. And then I have a friend who even carries 11 and a 12 weight rod. Um, and those are all uh, graphite. Hey, uh, Dean, yeah. um, I'm talking to Annette on chat mm -hmm. and uh, I'm asking for her email address and we can get with her after maybe to okay. help. Um, okay. So uh, Dean had uh, asked if there were any other questions. We're done otherwise. And then Linda, I think, um, um, you know, we can talk about when you might want to do an outdoor session, but I, I think, you know, probably in early March maybe would be the best time. Uh, yeah, well, the good news is we're a bunch of old farts, and uh, several of us are getting our shots now. Not necessarily yeah. me included, but um, yeah, I'll have I'll have my second shot uh, mid middle of next month. So, but but casting is not you know going out around the pond and and doing casting demonstrations is not a high risk uh, event anyway. You know, mm, as okay. long as we're masked up, I think we can <laughs> socially distance and do that. So, we'll get something out about it. And okay. um, I hope this was helpful to you. I really appreciate, uh, again, what Dean has done. And we're going to have uh, uh, our club vice president, Eric Sensiba, up. Are you up next week, next time, Eric? Two weeks from I now. I believe so, yeah. OK, yeah. two weeks from now. I, so. I, could I just add a footnote here? Yeah. Uh, and I, I think that it, like Dean was, was attempting to do, it's hard to use words to express the action when it comes to a fly rod or swinging a golf club. And I think for those of us who have used a fly rod for a good period of time and or swung a golf club, 
there is a phrase that's used to describe that and it's called trust your swing or trust your your cast <laughs> and yeah. once you get to that point it's like dean said you don't think about it anymore when i have helped people casting in the past the 11 to 1 o'clock is a great concept but there's another visual you can use also and that is think of the tip of your fly rod being parallel to the ceiling in your house. Yeah. And it's just going back and forth. Right. And the more that you can keep it parallel to the ceiling, the tighter your loops will be and the better your casting will be. Right. Uh, to learn that though, sometimes you're gonna go ahead and tie a knot in your leader as you do learn that. <laughs> but it's it's a it's a nice concept also. It's and actually the, the one to mention about casting is when we start out casting rather than have the line going back behind you where you can't see it and you're trying to look, well, is there a loop there? When do I bring it forward? Is to start out in small increments and have your rod just right in front of you like this, going back and forth with say three feet of line out and then extend it to six, seven feet, then 10 feet, then 15 feet. And then you get the feeling of the rhythm as the line unfolds going behind you and you see what it looks like and then the same thing going in front of you yeah. so just having the rod parallel to the ground you can see the action of the line going forward and going back and increase the length as you practice so those are things that i've used in the past to, that people um, it helps to get them to point from point a to point b quicker well as you can see eric eric understands and knows how to teach people i've never done it so i guess i <laughs> i'm going to tell you is that at the session that we do outside, Eric is going to be there <laughs> and he's going to help you guys understand all that. <laughs> when I learned to fly fish, it's after I opened a fly shop in oh, Harrison, Oregon. Yeah, yeah. And so the fellow who was helping me and teaching me, we had 12 people at the same time learning to fly fish. Everybody had their lines out and their rods yeah, out, yeah. They're out in the field and there was wires all over the place. And of course, we were all getting our lines tied up in the overhead wires, which was kind of a mess, but it was really a joke at the same time, but it, it works, yeah. Can I ask a question here? Yeah, sure. Was, about 10 minutes ago, our the screen froze. Oh. And, but no one else, I, I finally had to come out and then come back in. Oh, no. Uh, it could have been your internet, Larry, just some yeah. slow down over there. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, very yeah. good, very good lesson, Dean. Thank you. Yes, thank Our you. Pleasure. Dean. Hopefully, uh, thank you, Dean. Okay. And Take care. Right. And then we'll we'll see you in two weeks when Eric talks about insects. Um, and well, you can see the background I've already oh. got here. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. This is the life cycle of the mayfly. Yeah. And yeah. We'll talk about that on February 10th. And the caddis fly and the stone fly. And Dean has offered to do a special short presentation on terrestrials right. so that we know what to fish with and how to fish them at the end of summer. Yeah. yeah. So well, we're actually going to, gonna, uh, I think we're going to end this session with uh, a, a discussion of uh, how to fish certain flies. You know, um, that would be the last um, session that we're running. And then uh, Linda has a, is working on uh, a fish session with some experts on local water. And uh, I guess Linda, she'll, she'll uh, let everybody know when, when, that, uh, when that is set up. Okay. okay well, thank you all for being here today. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Happy to have you. All right, thank take you. care everybody. Bye-bye. Right, take care. Bye -bye. Stay, Stay safe. Thank you.